Today we're talking about colonial society, what life was like in the 13 colonies leading up to the American Revolution. So first off, we had a lot of population growth in the 1700s. Uh, American colonial villages were still struggling and fairly underdeveloped uh, in the 1600s, but over the course of a century they grew, they matured, and their inhabitants had slowly evolved a distinct culture, entirely their own, very different from any culture that had existed in Europe. In 1701, for example, the colonies had a population of 250,000. Now that's not counting Native Americans. But by 1775, the population had multiplied by 10 to 2.5 million. So you have huge population growth in the first three quarters of the 18th century. Also in 1701, there were only 28,000 African Americans in the 13 colonies, but by 1775, there were 500,000. Nearly half a million um, African Americans were uh, in the colonies, many of them having been shipped to the Americas or being born of those who had been shipped to the Americas. So two factors caused this rapid population growth. The first one was massive immigration. Now the immigration from Europe was mostly voluntary and the immigration from Africa was mostly involuntary through slave, the slave trade. Uh, in addition to massive immigration, you also had a very high birth rate among colonial families. Uh, many families had as, as many as 10 children. That was not uncommon at all. And so the population just went up, up, up throughout the 1700s. And both of these trends were the result of fertile American land and a dependable food supply making people want to move here. Immigrants to the American colonies mostly came from England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, collectively known as the British Isles. Uh, but there were also many French Protestant and German immigrants. Uh, French Protestants, known as Huguenots, would often flee France to escape religious persecution because France was mostly Catholic and ever since Louis XIV repealed the Edict of Nantes, um, no longer were they allowed to worship as Protestants. You also have a lot of immigrants from different German states of the Holy Roman Empire coming around this time. Motives for immigration, you have both push and pull factors. A push factor is something that makes you want to leave your country, and a pull factor is something that attracts you to another country. So one example of a push factor that made people want to leave Europe was to escape religious persecution and to escape wars. And a pull factor would be the economic opportunities in the New World. There was more land to develop, more opportunities to make money. Most immigrants settled in the middle colonies. That would be Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, <coughs> and Delaware. They settled there as well as on the western frontier of the southern colonies, which are Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. So New England did not have many immigrants in the 1700s, largely because they didn't have as much available land up there, and also the strict Puritan control that was over those colonies was a less attractive prospect for um, immigrants coming from Europe. So they mostly settled in the middle colonies and on the western frontier of the southern colonies. By far the largest group of non-English immigrants came forcibly from West Africa. African Americans made up 20% of the colonial population by 1775, and a full 90% of those um, African Americans lived in the southern colonies in a state of lifelong bondage that they had been forced into. Uh, African Americans formed the majority of the population in certain colonies, for example, in South Carolina and Georgia, they were about two-thirds of the population, and they were nearly half of the population of North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. Now, outside of the South, you still had some African Americans, though fewer. Um, you had thousands working as slaves in the North or as free wage earners and sometimes even as property owners. In all 13 colonies, there were laws that discriminated against African Americans and placed limits on their rights and opportunities. This began in the 1660s when the House of Burgesses realized that wealthy Virginia planters could make more money if they could keep African slaves in lifelong bondage instead of temporary indentured servitude, which is what they had uh, for about 40 years before that. The structure of colonial society. So you have English culture, English language, and English traditions really dominated the, um, the culture of the 13 colonies, while African, 
uh, German, French, Dutch, and Native American cultures all coexisted with this dominantly English culture, and at times even blended with the English culture uh, and uh, made what we call a melting pot. Now, every colony had a representative assembly, so voting uh, was in the hand of white male property owners. Uh, and those were the people who voted for the people who voted to represent everybody. Um, that's uh, what the representative assembly was. So all colonies allowed freedom of religion for all Protestant denominations. Uh, this is by the 1700s. So early on in Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1600s, you uh, were not allowed to be anything but a strictly observant Puritan. But a lot of those laws had relaxed by the 1700s, especially with the halfway covenant we learned about uh, last time. And by the 1700s, all of the 13 colonies allowed um, any type of Protestant to worship freely. Now, some colonies, like Massachusetts, did not grant religious tolerance to Catholics or to non-Christians. But others, like Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania being run by Quakers, they did allow um, total freedom of religion. The biggest departure from European culture was the lack of these social extremes. Uh, there was a lot less uh, enforced inequality in America as there was in Europe, uh, because in Europe you had hereditary aristocracy, you had nobility who were extremely lavishly wealthy, uh, and then you had the masses of hungry poor, where something like 95% in some cases did not get adequate nutrition because they were so incredibly poor. That wasn't really the case in America, not to say that people at times weren't poor in America, but there weren't those social extremes. Uh, instead, you had wealthy landowners at the top, uh, craftspeople and small farmers making up the majority of common people, and then of course slaves at the bottom. The family structure. So the family was the economic and social center of colonial life in the 13 colonies with an expanding economy which brought about ample food supply in the colonies. People were marrying at a young age and they were having more and more children. That caused the population to grow and that also made the family all the more important. Over 90% of colonists lived on farms. And while life was not easy, it did provide a higher standard of living than people had in Europe, uh, than commoners had in Europe, I should say. Most men worked, uh, whether farmers or working in town as a shopkeeper or a merchant of some sort. Land owning and politics were primarily reserved uh, for men, where women were expected to work in the home. Uh, the average colonial wife bore eight children during the course of her marriage and performed a wide range of tasks. Uh, some of the most uh, versatile, skilled people in uh, the colonies were women. They had to learn how to cook, how to clean, how to make clothes. Um, they had to learn basic medical care. They also educated their children. Uh, they worked alongside their husband on the farm or in the shop. So there was really nothing that these colonial women couldn't do. Uh, they were chefs, they were uh, seamstresses, they were uh, maids, they were doctors or nurses, they were teachers, all within their home. Shared labors between husbands and wives, as well as mutual dependence upon each other, uh, gave most women protection from abuse, and it also gave them an active role in decision making. And another positive about this system uh, is the fact that divorce was very rare. Um, abuse was very rare and divorce was very rare, unlike today. By the 1750s, almost half of England's world trade was with the American colonies. And all of the American colonies trade was with England because of the, uh, the protective sanctions that they put upon the American colonies to where um, the only people America could trade with was the English. Now, the colonial economy was agrarian, meaning it was based on agriculture. You have a limited amount of manufacturing. For example, you had some factories where rum was distilled, some where uh, flour was made. Um, those are just some small examples of manufacturing. But the large majority of colonial exports came from the farm, not the factory. New England's farmland was very rocky and their winters were very long and cold, so farming was only so 
uh, so profitable. Okay, it, it was mostly subsistence level. Um, New Englanders were able to uh, grow enough food to feed themselves and their family, but not enough to make a profit. Therefore, the economy of New England was based on logging, on shipbuilding, on fishing and trading and rum distilling, things you could do year-round and things that weren't dependent upon fertile soil. Now, farming was better the farther south you went. Uh, in the middle colonies, for example, you had some planters with 200-acre farms. Uh, iron making was also profitable in the middle colonies, and trading grew through the cities of New York and Philadelphia in particular. Farming was incredibly popular in, in the uh, southern colonies, very, very profitable to those who owned the farm. Uh, of course, it was built on the backs of slaves, so there was a very sharp uh, moral price to pay for that. Um, but 2,000 acre plantations existed. Those were not uncommon in the, in the south, just these massive plantations that would be the size of small towns. And some of the most common cash crops that were grown for profit were tobacco, rice, and indigo. Most plantations were self-sufficient, meaning you wouldn't have to leave the plantation at all in your life, and many people uh, didn't. For example, most plantations grew their own food. They had their own slave craftspeople. Uh, they were like little towns. Um, the Carolinas also exported timber, tar, and pitch to seal ships. Uh, most plantations were on the rivers so that their cash crops, uh, as well as their timber, tar, and pitch, could be shipped directly to Europe. Water travel was the most common form of travel in the colonies, largely along rivers, but sometimes along the Atlantic Ocean too, because um, many of the big cities, most of the population resided on the Atlantic coastline. The biggest trading ports were New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Charleston. New York and Philadelphia being in the middle colonies, Boston being in New England, and Charleston being in the southern colonies. You also had some overland travel by horse and, and buggy or horse and stagecoach. Uh, this became more common in the 1700s, and these new businesses popped up called taverns, and they would emerge along the countryside to serve as inns for the travelers, people who were traveling by horse and, and stage uh, to sleep for the night and to eat. But they also served as social centers for people who lived around the, the tavern, for, for the locals. And the, it was common for uh, religion and politics to be discussed, kind of like at a town square. By 1750, there was a postal system in the colonies using horses and small ships to go uh, through the rivers and along the Atlantic coast. And this operated both within colonies and amongst the colonies. As far as religion is concerned, uh, remember Maryland was founded by Catholics. New York City and Boston attracted some Jewish settlers, but the overwhelming majority of colonists were Protestant. They belonged to various Protestant denominations. So for example, Presbyterians and Congregationalists were common in New England. Congregationalists were the successors to the Puritans, not quite as strict, but still um, very much moralists. Then you have the Dutch Reformed Church that was very big in New York, because remember New York was originally settled by the Dutch and it was called New Amsterdam. Pennsylvania was home to Lutherans coming from Germany, uh, as well as Mennonites and Quakers. Some colonial governments had established churches. Uh, now an established church means a, an official institution that is supported by tax money that the government uh, doles out to it. Um, by the way, this is something that was outlawed in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but remember this is during colonial times, not after the founding of the U.S. Now because the Church of England was headed by the King of England, it was viewed as a symbol of English control in the colonies. So while the Church of England, or the Anglican Church as it was called, was the official state church of Virginia, it became much less popular as the tension between the American colonists and the English continued to grow. So as we get closer to the revolution, we're gonna see fewer and fewer Americans uh, calling themselves Anglican or Church of England, and you start to see um, Episcopalian becoming a new denomination, which is the same teachings as the Church of England, but not connected to England. The Great Awakening was a huge movement that took place in the 1730s and 40s. It was a religious movement that really transformed the religious culture and landscape of America. So during the 1600s, the Puritan times, uh, 
um, sermons focused mostly on human sinfulness, human depravity, and the perils of hell that awaited anyone who did not repent and live a more virtuous life. Now, by the early 1700s, the uh, religious fervor and um, the kind of zealous nature of religion in the colonies that the Puritans had brought had kind of faded away. The generation that was born in America was not as strongly, deeply religious as the Puritans who had fled um, religious persecution and were looking for a place to worship freely. Um, and because of that, by the early 1700s, sermons had become less um, zealous, less strictly um, moralistic or religious. They were mostly long intellectual discourses that portrayed God kind of as a benign creator. Think more like a, a seminary lecture rather than a, an impassioned sermon. Now, that all changed in the 1730s and 40s. You have this dramatic shift occurring that really swept through all the colonies starting in New England. Uh, this was known as the Great Awakening. It was a movement characterized by fervent, passionate expressions of religious feelings, religious fervor among masses of people. Uh, one of the people who began the Great Awakening was the Reverend Jonathan Edwards, who had a parish, uh, a Congregationalist church in Northampton, Massachusetts. And in a series of sermons that he preached in, I believe it was 1741, he argued that God was rightfully angry with human sin. And our only hope of escaping eternal damnation was deep penitence and moral, uh, moral living. This famous sermon, the most famous of which was called uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, uh, he also wrote a, a sermon that's in your uh, primary textbook uh, about the peace that God gives in contrary to the peace that the world offers. And so this became the new focus, um, inwardly examining yourself, um, acknowledging how sinful you are, repenting, uh, putting your trust in Jesus, and living a better life from there on forward. So while Edwards's influence spread throughout New England, uh, another person who really ignited the Great Awakening through the colonies as a whole was George Whitefield. And he traveled throughout the colonies, not just New England. And he preached these rousing sermons. Uh, he was from England, and he came to America in 1739. And he went from town to town and preached these very um, boisterous, passionate sermons. And the most common uh, subjects he would um, he would preach about would be the hellish torments of the damned. So what would happen to all of the souls um, who did not believe in Christ once they died? And this would terrify people and convict them uh, to make them want to give their life to Christ. He preached in barns. He preached in tents in the middle of fields, uh, sometimes attracting as many as 10,000 people for one sermon. Uh, this is where the concept of revivals came about, tent revivals. Uh, where you would have uh, a lot of people uh, deciding to give their life to Christ, uh, convicted by George Whitefield's sermons. Whitefield stressed God's omnipotence, that he was sovereign, that he was all-powerful, and that he was willing to save those who openly professed belief in Jesus, um, but that ordinary people, um, the people who uh, did not profess belief in Jesus, uh, that God would not save. Now, he also said that ordinary people, just everyday farmers and shopkeepers, women, children, that everyone could understand the Bible. Uh, Whitefield preached something fairly different from what most uh, institutional uh, churches preached, that um, the Bible is able to be understood by everybody, even by the common laity. And therefore, this really uh, challenged the authority of established churches. Uh, and it set the example for the colonies of challenging any kind of authority they saw as unnecessary, which led to them challenging the authority of the King of England uh, himself. But this idea of, you know, all you need is yourself and your Bible, uh, a, a, a heart open to understanding the Bible, and just the text in front of you, that that's all you need, that became a very American um, idea in American Christianity, that you don't need a priest or a pastor to explain to you what a text means. You don't need to read commentaries from people who came before us. All you need is the Holy Spirit to guide you. Emotionalism. 
became a very common part of Protestant church services in America. Uh, you also have some divisions emerging within denominations um, because you had some that embraced this more charismatic movement and others that were more traditional. Um, but this also contributed to a sense of American unity because according to Whitefield and Edwards and these other messages that were being preached, all classes of people were equal in the eyes of God. We were all equally destined for hell without repentance and faith in Christ. Uh, and so this kind of started the sense of American egalitarianism that really took root and fueled the American Revolution. Uh, the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church um, were very much fueled through this movement. They grew, um, as did people's desire for separation of church and state. Uh, cultural life in the colonies. So literature was mostly religious in the early to mid 1700s. You had uh, Massachusetts ministers like Cotton Mather and Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, they wrote many religious tracts. They would write these treatises that would be published that were long discourses on theological topics. You also had some political essays and treatises being written. Um, specifically on the topic of really drawing a line between American rights and English authority. Some famous authors of this era included John Adams, Thomas Paine, and Thomas Jefferson. So initially, literature in America was on very serious subjects. There wasn't much fiction. It was mostly on politics, uh, religion, and morality. Now, the most popular and successful American writer during the colonial era was Benjamin Franklin. He had a book of very witty proverbs uh, called Poor Richard's Almanac, and this sold a ton of copies. It was a best-selling book for 25 years. It was reprinted every year to fuel the demand, and people just ate it up. You can still read Poor Richard's Almanac. It has some uh, common sayings that we still say today. Uh, for example, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy and wealthy and wise, a uh, penny saved is a penny earned. All that comes from Poor Richard's Almanac uh, by Benjamin Franklin. You also had some forms of poetry starting around this time. For example, example there was an African-American female poet named Phyllis Wheatley, and she's noteworthy both for her triumph over slavery as well as for the quality of her poetry. Education, um, basic education was limited to, um, to boys, and it was also varied uh, greatly among the colonies. Now, formal efforts were directed, as I said, to males, usually males who came from uh, families with a little bit of money, um, since females were seen to be um, best trained for uh, housework only. Now, in New England, the Puritans' emphasis on learning the Bible led them to create schools, and these were the first tax-supported schools in America. Since the, um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had, a, uh, had an established church, the Puritan Church, uh, and later on the, co the uh, Congregationalist Church. That meant that taxes went to support the church, and therefore taxes could support schools where people would learn the Bible um, and learn other important skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, etc. A uh, Massachusetts law in 1647 required towns with um, 50 or more families to establish uh, primary schools to educate boys, and it required towns with a hundred or more families to provide not only primary schools but grammar schools as well to prepare boys for college. In the middle colonies, schools were either church-sponsored or were private, um, so they were not tax-supported, and oftentimes teachers lived with the families of their students. Then in the southern colonies, parents who could afford it gave their children uh, education in the form of tutors. For example, on uh, plantations, tutors would come to live with the family and they would provide instruction to the owner's children. Uh, it is important to note, though, that education was not only um, hard to come by for African Americans, but in most cases it was um, legally restricted. For example, you were not allowed to teach a slave how to read or write. Um, it was illegal to, uh, to educate a slave, um, punishable by the severest extent of the law. Um, and that was mostly to keep them in subjection because knowledge is power. You don't want, uh, they didn't want uh, the African Americans to uh, 
to start um, thinking for themselves, basically, and learning how to escape and learning how to organize and uh, defeat the power structures that were already there. So as far as higher education goes, Harvard was the first college in the 13 colonies. It was founded in 1636 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, which was Puritan country. And it was founded in order to give candidates for the ministry a proper theological and scholarly education. So it was founded originally as a divinity school or a seminary where people would learn Puritan theology. The second uh, established university in uh, the colonies was the College of William and Mary, which was established in Virginia in 1694. Uh, this was founded by the Anglican Church or the Church of England. And then Yale was the third university founded in 1701. Um, this was established in New Haven, Connecticut by Congregationalists. And both of these churches, like Harvard, were founded as divinity schools to promote Christian education, prepare people for the ministry. The Great Awakening in the 1730s and 40s prompted the creation of even more new colleges. Uh, between 1746 and 1769, you had five new colleges pop up. Uh, you had Princeton, which was founded by Presbyterians and funded as a Presbyterian uh, institution. Columbia, uh, which was in New York, was an Anglican institution. Brown in Rhode Island was a Baptist institution. Rutgers, uh, which like Princeton was in New Jersey, this was a Dutch Reformed University. And Dartmouth in uh, New Hampshire was Congregationalist. And most of these became what we now know of as the Ivy League. Now only one college with no religious sponsor was founded during this period, and that was the University of Pennsylvania. So there were various professions uh, throughout the 1600s that started to gain some respect. Uh, for example, in the 1600s, you pretty much just had Christian ministry as the only profession to enjoy um, widespread respect among the people, but that changed coming into the 1700s. Uh, you had professions like law and medicine and journalism gradually acquiring the kind of respectability and social prominence that being a minister of the faith um, previously held alone. So doctors at this time had little to no training. Uh, they were just people willing to operate and, and visit people and make house calls and make guesses about what was ailing them. Uh, oftentimes cures, quote cures, that doctors would give, uh, give people for epidemics like smallpox and diphtheria that were ravaging the colonies. These cures would sometimes even make people worse. Uh, for example, the earliest type of inoculations came around this time where people with smallpox, people who were infested with smallpox and had these big pus, pus balls on their bodies um, would be put on a wagon and gone from city to city and then the doctor would scrape the um, pus off of the, the infected person. Then he would come into someone's house and uh, the person would let them let him cut a little opening in their skin and infect them with the live smallpox germ. And this was the way that people wanted, uh, this was really the only um, option that people had for medical care. And a lot of times this would make people worse. Now the first medical college in the colonies was begun in 1765 as a part of the University of Pennsylvania, which was founded by uh, Benjamin Franklin. In the 1600s, people would often argue their own cases in court if they were convicted of something or if they were sued or if they um, needed to clear up a legal matter, they were expected to defend themselves. But then during the 1700s, as trade started to expand and the law became more complicated and legal problems themselves became more complex, it became clear that most people needed expert assistance when it came to the law. So lawyers started to be, uh, become respected in society, and they gained further respect in the 1760s and 1770s when people like uh, John Adams and Patrick Henry and other lawyers argued for colonial rights. They argued against uh, what they called English tyranny from a legal perspective. And this really provided the intellectual underpinnings of the American Revolution. Newspapers in the colonies were often weekly, they were usually one long sheet of paper that was folded four times, and newspapers largely were local. 
Sometimes they would include month-old news from Europe or local advertisements. Uh, one thing you'll read about in your uh, primary source book is uh, runaway advertisements. If your indentured servant or slave or maybe even wife ran away, uh, you would set out an advertisement in the local paper. Now, one groundbreaking legal case uh, in the history of journalism in America uh, is the case of uh, Zanger. Uh, this uh, newspaper columnist, Zanger, this reporter, uh, wrote very negatively about the governor of New York, and he was sued for libel. Uh, it was seen as illegal to write anything negative about the people in charge because that could incite rebellion. Even if it was true, it was illegal to write that. And this was a case that really set a precedent because the jury declared Zenger to be not guilty, even though technically he had broken the English law and wrote something negative about their appointee. Um, the jury of American colonists, the jury of his peers, appointed him not guilty. They ignored the law because they believed that there should be freedom of the press. So this is an important precedent that was set and later adopted into the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The majority of colon colonists rarely saw a newspaper, uh, rarely read any book other than the Bible. Uh, most whites were literate, um, but were only reading uh, the Bible. Now, as farmers on the frontier or even within a few miles of the coast, they often worked from first daylight to sundown, 12-hour uh, days, 14-hour days, 16-hour days in the summer, um, very hard-working, disciplined lifestyle. Um, the farmer's year was divided into four seasons. You had spring planting, summer growing, fall harvesting, and then winter preparation for the next uh, spring planting season. Food was usually plentiful on colonial farms. You didn't have very many um, severe droughts or famines during the time of colonial America. Food was overall fairly plentiful, um, but light and heat in the colonial farmhouse were limited to the kitchen fireplace and to candles. So this is way before electricity, um, no street lights because you're in the country and in, in this, uh, this rural uh, situation. And so basically your kitchen fireplace and any strategically placed candles that you might have around your house, that's where light was limited to. Another reason why people didn't read all that much. Um, entertainment for the rich uh, in the country included card playing and horse racing in the south. Uh, it included theater going in the middle colonies. And in Puritan New England, the wealthy were entertained by attending religious lectures because it was Puritan country. And finally, this concept of an emergence of a national character. So the colonists' motivation for leaving Europe, um, the political heritage of the English monarchy, and the influence of the American natural environment all combined together to bring about this distinctly American viewpoint, this distinctly American culture and way of life. Now, especially among white male property owners, the colonists would exercise their rights of free speech and a free press. They became accustomed to electing representatives in their colonial assemblies, uh, and they tolerated a variety of religious beliefs. So all of these things that were forming in America were very different from the old ways in Europe. Uh, English travelers in the colonies often remarked that Americans were restless. They were always trying to look for ways to, to uh, improve their circumstances, very entrepreneurial, always waking, looking for ways to make more money, and also very practical, um, finding use for anything that was placed in their lives, so very industrious. And uh, the abiding quality of Americans then, and, and even much later, well into our uh, history of our republic, was seen as optimism. This was seen as the abiding quality of Americans, the sort of national American emotion that uh, it is possible to have a good life and you can always improve and things are always uh, going to get better and all we need to do is think positively. So that was really the national character that had emerged by the time of the American Revolution. So that is life in colonial society. Next time, we'll talk about the lead up to the American Revolution with imperial wars, colonial protest, and then talk some about the founding fathers.